Um, I'd like to call to order the regular monthly meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission for Wednesday, September 28th, 2016. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Yamada, will you do a roll call, please? Chair Longstreet. Vice Chair Clark. Here. Commissioner Wiscombe. Here. Commissioner Cavazos. Here. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton. Here. Commissioner Martinez Cohen. Here. Do we have any changes to the agenda? No. Nope. Okay. Written communications? Okay. It's time for a public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for a public discussion before the commission. The total amount of time for public comments will be 15 minutes. We have one slip here. It's Mr. Kenneth Locke. You have two minutes. Okay. Welcome. Uh, I mentioned to the school board, my name is Kenneth Locke. Um, it is the basis of uh, being mentally fit, mental fitness, in relation to physical fitness and how the two are actually relatively the same thing. And I make a claim of actually being the first teacher healer uh, to actually provide the means for becoming mentally fit, which is kind of like being intelligent in relation to actually uh, an exercise practice which is intelligent. It turns out that tennis has not been intelligent or physically fit based on the fact that it promotes one-sidedness, one arm, and I'm actually here to change that holistic health and the idea of uh, tennis in relation to its ultimate meaning is to actually develop both arms equally. So I'm teaching that. And uh, I'm sorry to say that the, the teachers down there right now are actually decreasing people's intelligence because it's kind of misinformation and then also making them physically retarded again based on the fact that they're only developing one side of their bodies and I'm going to probably get more into that with the school board because right now I'm sorry to say that the, the school system that we have right now in relation to sports competition is kind of again declining our intelligence and kind of dumbing down mentally and then also uh, retarding us physically and I'm here to kind of save the day. My project's called Tennisance or the Tennisance Method, the Renaissance of Tennis. It's kind of, I'm kind of like the Pilates of tennis. So the idea of, uh, of using tennis as an exercise that again integrates the mind and body. I just thought I'd take the time to share that with you today. Get ready to wind up. Pardon me? Get ready to wind up. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Have a nice day. Thank you Mr. Locke. Um, do we have a youth council report? <clears throat> Vice Chair Clark, we have two members of the youth council, Daniela Trisler and Jensen Steady, who are here to give the commission their report for the month. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Jensen Steady, and I am the um, treasurer of the youth council. I'm Danielle, and I'm the secretary of the youth council. Um, so, firstly, we currently have 10 youth council members and one junior high representative, and we are currently recruiting. So if you know of any students that might be interested, please have them apply. Um, we're looking for one student from Santa Barbara High School, one from Dos Pueblos High School, two from an alternative high school, and one from a private high school. Uh, we are currently working on two upcoming events. We are working with our liaison and the West Side neighborhood to host a meet and greet with the chief of police on November 14th. So we just want our peers to come and be able to meet her and her to be able to make connections with the peer in our or the youth in our community. Um, we are also working on our first youth speak out, which um, has to do with Prop 64, which is the legalization of medical marijuana, actually recreational. Um, we've also received an invitation to visit Lompoc, and we've extended an invitation for them to come down to network to youth councils around Santa Barbara. And we are also currently working with Just Communities Youth Leaders to apply for the Youth Making Change Grant, 
that would help facilitate conversation and support teens in the community who may need support because of being undocumented or otherwise underrepresented. Our next meeting is Monday the 3rd, and we will hear a presentation from the Coalition of Youth Advocates on tobacco and youth laws. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that excellent report. If anybody's watching is interested in applying, where would they look for more information? Just um, in case there's people watching at home right I now. I think you can go, if you just search Santa Barbara Youth Council, I think you can go on the website and there should be the application there. Great. Thank you. So just for the commission's benefit, it is a city council does appoint youth council members, and so the application process is similar to yours. Now we're moving on to commissioner and committee assignment reports. Uh, Mr. Kovacev? Nothing to report. Jacob? I don't have anything to report. Neither do I. Um, on September 21st, Leslie and I attended the Park Foundation board meeting where we finalized our budget for the coming year and we discussed our priorities in supporting the Parks Department, one of which will be the Cabrillo Bathhouse renovation project. And then on the 24th, with my 12-year-old, I attended the Creeks Division Creek Week Land Shark Tour um, where we learned about Santa Barbara Creeks Department's creek restoration water quality endeavors. Um, Liz Smith, our Creeks Department Outreach Coordinator, did an excellent job getting our community excited about Creek Week. And Cameron Benson, the Creek Restoration and Clean Water Program Manager, did an excellent job of educating participants about the Creek Department's endeavors. It was really, really fun. Next, we have Employee Recognition Service Award pins. Hi, Chair Clark, members of the Commission. I have three staff that uh, were recognized at City Council uh, this month. Uh, first, I'd like to start with Tara Yamada, who received her 30-year pin, 30 years of service to the city. And then we also had two additional staff that um, completed 10 years of service. Artemio Aranda, who works as a grounds maintenance worker, too, in the Parks Division. And then also John Velasco, who's a park ranger. Both of them 10 years with the city. Um, congratulations to all those employees, and thank you for your dedication and commitment to the department. Um, now we're moving on to consent items. The summary of council actions. Are there any questions? Nope. And the minutes. Are there any questions on the minutes? I'll move that we um, accept the minutes from the regular meeting of the Parks and Rec Commission for Wednesday, August 24, 2016. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? That passes. Um, now we're moving on to administrative and staff reports, and we have a golf update, general manager introduction. Vice Chair Clark and members of the Commission, uh, we have Mark Sewell and our new golf course manager here to talk about what's going on at uh, Muni. As you know, we spent a number of years trying to come to um, where we are today, and it's been three months, three months since we switched over. So I'd like to turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Ms. Zachary. So, uh, Chair Clark and Commissioners, my name is Mark Sewell. As, as Ms. Zachary said, I'm the Parks and Recreation Business Manager. And we are now three months into the new operation at Santa Barbara Golf Club. And I'm uh, pleased to give you a sort of a very brief update of to how um, that whole process has sort of been playing out over the last few months. And delighted as well to introduce to you and allow an opportunity to introduce himself and speak a little bit about what, uh, how excited he is to be working with us in our partnership. Mr. Randy Shannon, who's the, the general manager for Santa Barbara Golf Club. So Santa Barbara Golf Club, like a lot of municipal golf clubs, had a number of fiscal challenges for a number of years. And uh, there was a lot of public uh, engagement and uh, conversation about how could we um, look to rectify the financial um, outlook for the golf course, which at some points was looking pretty poor in terms of its ability to pay its bills. And one of the options that was put forward was to uh, look to bring in a professional golf management company 
to operate the maintenance and the pro shop. And that's exactly what we did, um, commencing July the 1st. Um, however, there was a number of months of planning and transitional um, organisation that was going on to make sure that the relevant staff who were working in both the maintenance and the pro shop uh, were communicated to, had the opportunity to um, meet and, and discuss their opportunities going forward. And delighted to say the vast majority of the staff who were working at the golf course prior to the transition are now still working at the golf course after the transition. Um, and along with that, the, the city permanent staff who uh, were remaining at the golf course on the last day of, of maintenance operation have transferred and, and are doing a very good job for us in our parks division. And, uh, and so after three months, the, the golf course is already showing some significant signs of improvements in terms of maintenance. Uh, we've been able to invest more of our budget into the maintenance costs. We're still extremely challenged, of course, by the, the, the huge drought that Santa Barbara has. But I'd like to remind you all that 90% of the water that's used on the golf course is recycled. So if it's looking green, it's actually with recycled water that it's green. Um, and so we are still achieving all of the savings that are required of us from a drought standpoint. And one of the key uh, exciting things that we were looking for with a partner to take the golf club forward was the ability to offer new and enticing um, innovations and promotions to get more golfers out there and playing and working with the Mulligans restaurant, who we now have a new 10-year lease with as well. Um, and so I'd like to take the opportunity for, for Randy to come up and say a few words. And, of course, if you have any questions of of myself or Randy, please, at any point, jump in. But, Randy, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Good afternoon. Well, thank you for the opportunity and, and the introduction. Obviously, uh, myself, uh, being here for just three months, I don't know. I probably won't receive a pin, I guess. But um, we are extremely excited to be here. And, obviously, with Corsco and uh, the team that uh, we were pretty much inherited, because most of the people stayed with us, were very excited for the growth and the opportunities we have. And from our client base through our uh, team members that we currently have, we've heard a lot of good positive responses and looking forward to the growth as we uh, are seeing some in rounds of golf and other areas. And uh, like I say, just excited to be a part of the city and working with you as well. So thank you for having us here and uh, look forward to working closely with you. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any comments or questions? I'd just like to say that um, I think you, you've done a fantastic job. Um, so far, the um, emails with the specials that you sent out are really zippy and, and, you know, kind of get you excited about getting out there and playing. Um, uh, I don't have um, my direct reporter because my husband had knee surgery but he plays there and he'll be back there next week he can't wait um he plays there a couple times a week and and loves it but i have heard from other golfers that the course is in really great shape and um it's doing doing really well and um i hope that the it it sounds from the staff report that um mr sewell put together that you're working closely with mulligans um so i hope that relationship really melts together nicely and um, smoothly and and we get some added benefits from that relationship so Great. thank you very much for thank what you. you've done I really enjoyed reading the staff report that you sent secret shoppers to the concession to the pro shop to shop <laughs> and I would have loved to have been a fly on that wall but I'm glad to see they had some good results and liked what they saw that was great if I could just add a few comments to the commission, um, I alluded to it initially. It was, is it's been tough, and the commission's played a really critical role in the changeover. But I, I have experienced in the last three months not only the energy and commitment coming from our new golf course management company, Corsco, and the staff that they've brought in. The fact that many of the staff that didn't have permanent city positions were able to continue to work there, and that's been really positive because they were trained under Simone Herrera, who we now have working in our parks division and bringing his skills there, uh, and, the, and the work effort of, of Mark Sewell, and then, and then also the parks division employees, that, that the former golf employees who are now parks division employees and the parks division employees that have embraced uh, their new colleagues. We feel like the transition 
even though it was very much anticipated, a lot of work went into getting to where we were July 1. A lot of work's gone into keeping it going and being successful. And fr from all appearances, we're in about as good a place as we could be under the circumstances. And I, I've also gotten comments on just the changeover at the golf course and then checking in with our staff. Their changeover has worked out has worked out well as 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 well. So so we feel like you know we're we're on a good path, and we hope to come back in a quarter or maybe at the end of the year and have another report for you. Um, I'm glad to hear that everything went really smoothly. I know that it was a little controversial or a little tough, and I know I wasn't part of the commission when that happened. But um, I think it sounds like everything kind of smoothed over very nicely. So I'm happy to hear that. I, I also want to add, um, um, I think uh, we owe the department um, a lot of um, commendations for how smoothly it has gone. And, and reading in the report that um, Simone is, is still goes out and inspects and, and works with the new, the new uh, maintenance staff is, is really great. And that just really helps make the transition smooth. So um, congratulations to the department for making that all happen. The next item on our agenda is advisory committee liaisons, and this is for action. And you weren't here last week, last month. Right. So um, I would like to be a part of the creeks and uh, restoration and water quality improvement program. Um, I know that that one has a vacancy, obviously, as well. So, uh, And I wasn't clear on if we are um, needed to do more than one liaison relationship. Um, I'm, I'm open to, to helping out wherever else I might be needed. I don't know. I know that the, the, the arts and craft show one is also vacant. Are they regular meeting? Um, it, it seems like they have one event a year. Is that right? And I don't really know very much about it. I was just going to say, on the meeting schedule, it says it's the second Tuesday of every month at 6, 3 to 9. Is that correct? Oh. And that's right. They're actively meeting. Okay. Yeah, for for um, commissioner's benefits, you know, I can tell you the Creeks Committee generally meets the third Wednesday. Doesn't there may be times where it, it may miss a month just based on what's going on. Mm -hmm. Arts and Craft Show definitely meets once a month. Uh, one of the advantages of the Creeks Committee is you also get to go on field trips. So if you like field trips, that's a good one. We do too. Commission does too. It, we've had some recent uh, Creeks Committee field trips, and that's a key priority if you want to get out and see those projects. It's an opportunity to do that as well. Definitely. So are you are you interested in both or just the creeks? Um, I would prefer just to do the creeks um, unless I'm needed. Anyone else interested in arts and craft advisory committee? No. Okay. So Andrea will do it for six months and then we'll revisit that appointment. Thank you. Um, now we have a after school programs report. Vice Chair Clark, members of the commission, we have two of our recreation division staff, Emily Fox, who's a supervisor, and also Jeff Smith to supervisor to give you today's presentation.
It helps if it's on. Right. Madam Chair and Commissioners, we wanted to share with you the after-school programs that we provide as a department. As a department, we're dedicated to providing youth and teens with after-school programs that keep them safe, active, as well as engaged. In order for us to fund and facilitate these programs, we work with community partners as well as the Santa Barbara Unified School District with the philosophy that when we're all working together, we're able to accomplish more. We can serve more students and we can provide more quality programs. Uh, the department's involved in two traditional after-school programs. These programs are, uh, we fund, there we go. The department's involved in two traditional after-school programs. These programs are for first through sixth grade students. They're provided at 10 local elementary schools. The first program is the After School Opportunities for Kids, which is referred to as AOK, as well as the Recreation After School Program, referred to as RAP. And these programs are offered during school days. They begin immediately at the end of the school day and extend until 5.30 p.m. if students are involved in the RAP program and until 6 p.m. if they're involved in the AOK program. So the AOK program, as well as the After School Education and Safety program, referred to as ACES, they're administered by the Santa Barbara Unified School District. The AOK program is provided at 10 local elementary schools. These programs, again, are for first through sixth grade students, offered directly at the end of the school day until 6 p.m. And then for our after school education and safety program, it's offered at La Cumbra Junior High for students in seventh through eighth grades. These programs focus on supporting English language learners in working on um, supporting those students that are socioeconomically disadvantaged, as well as students that need work on really reaching that scholastic achievement gap. They also focus on at-risk students. And to achieve this, during each, each after-school program day, they provide a scholar hour, or as we like to call it, brain building, where students get the chance to work on reading development, homework assistance, as well, their, as, well as other STEAM-based activities. They also have the chance to participate in recreation programs, in enrichment activities where other community partners will come on campus and teach uh, small programs or get them involved in special clubs. Within the AOK program, the department provides uh, recreation support. So at six out of our seven AOK program sites, there are two recreation program leaders. Those recreation program leaders oversee a group of 20 students. They take them throughout the entire after school program day, working with them during the scholar hour, working with them on their group meetings as well as when we transition to enrichment time, they do an hour's worth of SPARK curriculum. And that SPARK curriculum might be talking and working with them on flying disc skills, better known as Frisbee, on dodgeball, football. Uh, in addition, there are two full-time staff members that are involved in the leadership team within the AOK program. That's one of our program coordinators who 50% of her time is dedicated to overseeing the recreation program staff that work in the AOK program, as well as being a member of that leadership team that helps chart the course of the program, as well as make bigger picture decisions, as well as myself. Um, and again, we work with three of their full-time staff to make sure that the program is meeting all of its um, goals, as well as, as making any decisions about future programs, future partnerships, um, especially to make sure that we're really meeting those students that we're serving. During the 2015-16 school year, we had 850 students that participated in the AOK and ACES programs. There were 700 at the AOK elementary school programs, and then 150 at our ACES junior high school programs. So the recreation after school program is similar in nature to the AOK program, except that it's administered exclusively by the department. We have four RAP program sites at Adams, Roosevelt, Washington, and Monroe Elementary Schools. We follow a similar program structure. The program begins at the very end of the school day. 
And then from the end of the school day until 5.30 p.m., we do a scholar hour with students. We work with them on homework. Again, we do the scholastic and enrichment activities to help build their brains. We do recreation activities. We'll take them on field trips. We'll also do other fun enrichment activities. The difference between the program is really that we go out of our way to provide inclusion support for the students that attend the RAP program. So really wanting to make sure that anyone interested in attending the program, whether they have uh, a medical need and or a special need, that we can provide them with the support they need to be successful. In addition, we also provide scholarships. Um, both the AOK and the RAP program are incredibly affordable, and they really look at assisting parents, especially working parents, who otherwise wouldn't have supervision or activities for their kids to be engaged in after school. So the RAP program, uh, our unduplicated participation, has increased over the last few years. Uh, from two, between from 2014-15 to the 2015-16 school year, we increased by 51 students, which was an 11% increase from last year. And one of the reasons we found the, that program participation is really increasing is partly because of the increase in working parents. Uh, we have more and more of our families where both parents work. We're, we've also found that parents really appreciate the flexibility of our program. Uh, the AOK program is a grant-funded program, and so part of the grant funding, there's a requirement that students participate five days a week with minimal absences, and then they're required to stay on site until 5.45 p.m., and that's for the AOK elementary program, which for a lot of parents, it's incredibly beneficial. They also get to stay and do supper at the end of the AOK program. For a number of our RAP families, they appreciate the ability to stay until 5.30 p.m., but a number of those families attend on a more flexible schedule. They might attend Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. They also have the ability to pick up their students at any point in time throughout the school day or throughout the after-school program day. So if they happen to have soccer practice, if they happen to be leaving on a trip, if they have... Um, a tutor that's coming in to work with their student, they can pick them up at 4 p.m., 4.15 p.m., uh, et cetera. We also have noticed that the relationships developed by staff with the students that participate in our programs, that's another reason for the increase. Uh, at the beginning of each school year, we have, you know, numerous families calling to say, you know, can you tell us who the program directors are going to be? Are these program leaders going to be here? Um, and again, most of the parents and the kids get so excited when they hear that, yes, all of our RAP directors are returning again this year. In addition to the RAP and AOK after-school programs, the department also offers after-school sports leagues. Um, the we offer the program to third through sixth graders in the local elementary schools. The sports programs are offered to basically the same goals that Emily has already um, given you, you get the commissioners. Uh, we we are, um, engage more kids in fun programs. We keep kids on campus in a safe environment, and we provide opportunities for kids to be active after a long school day in the classroom. The Santa Barbara School District also offers junior high school sports leagues at the four junior high schools in a variety of different sports. The city tra transitioned the sports uh, programs to the school district a few years ago. We were running flag football, basketball, and soccer leagues at the junior high schools, and the transition in the, since that transition period the school district has included volleyball, lacrosse, and track and field. 453 students participated last year. That's an unduplicated number. 400 of those students participated in multiple sports, which I think is a, a good sign that the leagues are, are fun and, and the kids are enjoying the programs. The department offers after school sports leagues at 16 local elementary schools. The three sports we offer are flag football, basketball, and soccer. Um, each sports season is eight to 10 weeks long. Each team practices at least one time per week on campus, and then there's one scheduled game 
per team off campus, uh, flag football and soccer are played at Dwight Murphy Park, and then the basketball program for the most part is played at the outdoor basketball course at the Santa Barbara Junior High School. So we have a good relationship with the principal there at the junior high and it allows us to get all the kids in one spot and all the games going on in, in one, one area so we can supervise the kids and the referees and coaches. And it makes the, the league more fun. So each team has a co an assigned coach. Referees are at each game to make sure the games are um, starting on time and they're fair and they're fun and the referees are blowing whistles and, and keeping the game moving and, and making it fun for the kids. The kids love to, to be transported from school to the way sites and play the games. Um, they look forward to it each week. And they, when they win, they come back excited on the van and we keep team records throughout the season, and then we end up each season with a season-ending playoff format, usually held at Santa Barbara City College campus. So this slide is showing the participation number of unduplicated students or, or players in the past three seasons. You can see the trend has been going down. 2013-14 um, school year it was our largest participation year, we had 980 students that were unduplicated, and that was 1,300 kids that participated throughout the season. Um, again, another 300 plus students are participating in multiple sports. And then we've, we've trended down. Um, there's been some challenges the last few years with the after school sports program. Basically the same thing, it's really important for us to have a consistency in our coaches. Um, and the, the goal is to have the coaches coach each sports season throughout the school year and, and, and be around that school year. That, that helps the kids a lot to be energized and um, interested in participating in the sports. Um, so that's our big challenge is, is keeping coaches. If they can return a second year, that's great for our program. And we have a number of coaches that have done that, but we've had schools and coaches where um, it's just a constant transition period. So our, our challenge is recruiting and hiring new coaches. We're, we're, youth activities and sports is working closer this year with using, utilizing after-school RAP staff to, that are there five days a week already as coaches. So that's going to help with the consistency. Um, we've provided more transportation than we have in the past. In the past years, we've, we transported five of the schools, all the AOK sites. This year, we're, we've included the... RAP sites, so Monroe, Washington, and Roosevelt schools now get transported to the game. So that's going to help a lot, especially with the Monroe, um, Monroe and Washington families. So that should help with our participation level. Sorry. And the last slide I have here is our community partnerships. We work closely with these four groups in, in the after schools um, programs for youth. Santa Barbara Swim Club offering swimming programs at the Los Banos Pool. Santa Barbara Pony Baseball is one of our key partners at McKenzie Park. They serve over 400 kids a year in baseball programs, fall and spring leagues. They, um, they've done a lot of improvements there at McKenzie Park. They care about the park. They take care of it. The fields are in great shape. Um, they keep us on our toes to make sure the, the fields are in good shape for the kids. Club West runs track and field programs and mainly cross country in the junior high level. And then Santa Barbara Police Activities Leagues, they're uh, running the team programs and the teen center and also do some sports programs. So they serve over, they served over a thousand students this past year. So the department uh, provides funding to be able to support all of the after-school programs that are provided not only by the department, but also by our community partners in the district. So on the screen, it shows you the breakdown of the actual funding that is provided to all of our after-school programs, and all of these funds come from the general fund. Now, with the AOK program, keeping in mind the AOK program is managed by the district, the district's overall expenditures to operate that program are $897,000. In addition, they receive $600,000 in donations and in-kind services. 
Now, the city's piece of that, which goes into the $600,000 donations and in-kind services that they use, is the city provides $47,385,000, as well as $79,800 of in-kind services. And that's with administrative support, uh, support with the SPARC program, and all of the other uh, recreation activities that we, we uh, add to the AOK program. For the junior high school sports league, the city's contribution is $32,000, but in addition, the district provides $40,000, and the city of Goleta provides $13,000. And again, that's for the junior high sports leagues. For the after school sports leagues, it's $75,000 to support those programs. And then for the wrap after school program, again, the program that's similar to the AOK program, but that's operated exclusively by the department, it's 260000 to operate that program. Again, that's at the four school sites, giving kids a safe and enriching activities after school. But in addition, we recover 262000 in revenues, which includes the $50,000 that's offered in scholarships, so that that program is accessible and affordable to all of our families, especially those families um, in need. So now the department's total funding contribution for the after-school programs that are offered by our community partners is $494,185. Now we've found that working together with our community partners, as well as with the Santa Barbara School District, the department has been able to provide youth and teens with safe, active and engaging activities, reaching 3,570 unduplicated participants this last school year. And when you look at the reported uh, school district totals for last year, that's 56% of the district student population. We're strong believers in reaching as many youth and teens as we possibly can, making sure that they have those uh, activities after school that keep them well supervised, that help give them enriching opportunities to grow and develop. And we truly feel that working together with our community partners as well as the district, we're able to accomplish that even better than if we were to do that on our own. That's the end of our presentation. If you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear them. I was just doing my math, some math. I wasn't really on my phone. Yeah. I divided $494,185 by 3,570 children. That's roughly only $100 a kid, and they're getting so much good out of that. That's amazing. Vice Chair Clark and Commissioners, I just want to jump in because I know it's really the floor is yours now. I can't even um, explain, although I can imagine if you sat in one of these seats and you had to put on this program, these programs, the logistics, the time that goes in to planning them. You know, some of the challenges that we have with retention of coaches have done an excellent job with retaining the RAP youth leaders. We do that in the summertime, too, if you think about it. We have kids coming back or youth coming back, teens coming back to grow in our programs and become counselors or become lifeguards. And really the work of the recreation staff is year-round. They're either planning for summer or they're planning for school or they're planning for summer or they're planning for school. And so, you know, both Emily and Jeff are super busy in the summertime, too. It's not like they go, oh, I'll get the summer off, school's out. No, they launch right into summer programs. And the logistics are pretty immense, as you can imagine, if you thought about what it would take to pull something like these programs off. I'd just like to say thanks so much for the presentation. I thought it was it was really great. Um, it, it is, as as Ms. Zachary said, it's, it's commendable what you have done and how the numbers have grown. Um, I wanted to ask a specific question. Now, these coaches in the... Um, um, after school sports league, they they're paid coaches. Our, we have both paid and volunteer coaches. Okay, and and um, do you have are, are the volunteer coaches experienced, or is there an opportunity to for someone to volunteer to help in something? In other words, if the participation has decreased because of the the staff. Um, and you might need more volunteers, how does one do that? 
Whether you're a volunteer or a city employee working as a coach, you have to apply. So fill out an application, and they're interviewed and um, live scanned and TB tested. And once that's all passed, they do go through a training before the season starts. So usually the volunteer coaches are actually more experienced because they're probably mostly fathers or mothers that have um, coached teams in the past. So um, they're an asset to the, to the program. The paid coaches are more college students, possibly even high school students. Uh, that's, high school is rare, but it has happened. And um, they receive training, but usually they're former players, so not necessarily have the experience coaching. And even more than that, just being able to supervise kids and um, keep the practices and games fun. And so it takes, a, you know, it takes, honestly, it takes a year of going through each of the sports and getting that experience. So that's why when they do come back for a second year, it, it's amazing the difference and amazing how much more participation comes from that school when the, when the coaches return. So do you have a specific time of year when you have a call for all, all. volunteers <laughs> in coaching? And how does, if someone's listening, how does one, you know, get involved in, in volunteering? Right. Um, do, you have to be, do you have to really know the sport well to, to volunteer, or can you? Yes. Okay. I mean, and we do, we would consider somebody with, with no experience, but um, they would have to have knowledge of the sport in some capacity. Um, so we, we're recruiting coaches all year long. We do put an emphasis before summer, before the college students leave the area to go back to where they, wherever they um, come from. So we try usually April, May to reach out to college age uh, students. And then when they return back to Santa Barbara, we're recruiting again but okay and i'm i'm so i guess i guess what i'd like to see is that the recruit recruitment process maybe is a little bit more is is better advertised and maybe into a wider and broader spectrum of people maybe some of the you know mothers and fathers of of people that have played in these leagues and, you know, might want to stay involved and realize the value of the program because that, that happens all the time. If, if you see your child, you know, make huge positive changes from being in the program, you might want to volunteer and, and continue that, continue that. So that, that's why I'm asking the question. Um, so I think it would be nice if it were, you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that myself. So, um, but um, I think it's pretty impressive with 56% of the unified school district population participating. It's that's that's a phenomenal number. I mean, I got to think that's well above any national any national average that's out there. So, and and you know, I also think with the, you know, we're going to face more challenges. With, you know, we've got uh, AUD coming online. So we've got, you know, we're going to have some higher density housing in the city. And I think there's going to be more demand for these kinds of after school programs. Um, so I, I um, hope that council, I, are the, is it challenging for council to support this? Or has it been, um, I, I, I know capital projects is always we'll put that at the top of the list of challenges for general fund budget but um has this been well vice chair clark and commissioner wiscom of commission we go through challenging budget times and and you were a commissioner back when we really had to yes. reduce our budget drastically um, we have had challenges with our youth programs, but we've often tried to leverage all of the different resources, and I think that's one of the benefits here, is Council does recognize that given that we have partnerships um, with the school district, we have kids that are already at school, they can play at those schools, uh, we have a very long history of working with the school district. We have a really well-developed partnership that we've tried to preserve it where we can. We did lose funding or reduce funding for years, but then it's been increased and it's been brought back. And there were times where, um, you know, we 
had to look at changing our program to be able to continue to provide some service without eliminating it. There's a time youth activity, um, the police activities league took over the junior high and then the you know, junior highs took over. So there's been a lot of movement around. I think we would say, and uh, my colleagues can jump in and correct me, is that we're in a pretty good place right now in terms of who's doing what for these programs and we're building, our strengths are in certain areas and they have strengths in other areas as well. Great, okay, well, um commend you you both thank you for the excellent report and um, I know mr. Cavazos wants to speak and it, it I knew I knew he would this is right <laughs> up his alley no but I just I think I think it's it's really a sensational um, it speaks wonders to the success of what you've done thank you yeah and I'll just kind of piggyback on top of that I mean voicing my support for what you guys do. It, it's so important to to have these types of programs. Uh, I think I've made no secret that I was not the best behaved teenager. <laughs> I'm not growing up in Santa Barbara, so you can't pin anything on me. But, you know, when I was involved in sports, I was all right and doing stuff. And when I wasn't involved in, in after school or sports things, I just let my creativity get the best of me and found probably stupid things to do. You know, I support these types of things. Uh, with when I was at Pony Baseball working with you guys, getting the kids to do something, whether it's an after school program or a sports program, it, it's just absolutely mandatory that we do that. If we don't, our kids are going to do something else, and it, you know, it'll end up costing us more down the road. Uh, both of my kids participated in, in some of the programs. Uh, my oldest, who is not athletically inclined whatsoever, played flag football, had a blast. And, you know, it was just so important for him to be out there. You know, for me, it was just, dude, just run around, you know, try and catch the ball or, you know, knock it down. And it was just, you know, so important for him to be out there getting the exercise. But to your points, you know, he's learning, you know, camaraderie and sportsmanship. And, and these are things that go well beyond just physical activity. It's things that he's going to be able to use. So again, I mean, anything we can do to keep these things funded or find ways to get them funded, you know, it, it's an absolutely uh, a mandatory thing that we have to do. So thank you guys for what you do. We often find too in both the AOK and the RAP program that we'll have teachers who will recommend students who share that, you know, they need a little extra support after school, a little extra supervision. Um, and with both programs, we've seen dramatic results where when we partner with the school day, so the teachers who are working with these students from the time they arrive to school to the time the school day is done, and then we work with them either in the RAP program or AOK, -okay, it's that continued care. And so from the time they enter either AOK -okay or RAP to the end of the school year, I mean, the progress and, and how they develop and how they're able to socially, you know, interact with their student or with the other students in their peer group uh, is really phenomenal. Uh, and it's nice, too, because it gives us that chance to work hand-in-hand -hand with the teachers. Uh, both programs actually work with academic liaisons as well. Uh, so at each of the different elementary school campuses, there's a teacher that becomes that liaison so that if staff have questions on how to best support students with homework, uh, if a student is struggling, maybe they seem to be acting out, they can find what tips and techniques have worked for the classroom teacher, the PE teacher, et cetera, so that we can carry those on uh, during the RAP and AOK -OK day too. So. There's just uh, one other aspect I wanted to touch on. You talked a lot about the amazing things you're doing for the children, but you're doing just as much good for the, the families as a full-time working single mother. Finding childcare is one of the most difficult and expensive things you can do when you've got small kids and you're making it affordable and easy. So you're alleviating stress on whole families and improving the quality of life on the home front too. So thank you for that part of it. Um, We're going to move on to the Davis Center Remodel Project. Vice Chair um, Clark and Commissioners, we have Justin Van Mellum, who's an associate planner in our department, as well as Ellen Bildston, who's uh, architect working on this project for today's presentation. 
You will be getting more information about some of the other capital projects that we have going on next month, sort of as an update. And then, because we're going into a new two-year financial plan, we're also updating our six-year capital program, which will be before the commission in November. So as you hear today's presentation, you'll see where we are in this project. We'll give you a status report next month of where we are with all of our other projects. Um, so that'll cue us up to come forward in November with our proposed six-year plan and our recommendations for funding for those two years. We have two new commissioners, so this is going to be a new thing for you. So we're trying to do it in a way that it seems logical and linear, and it is really, uh, but there's a lot, lot going on in the department. Um, so with that, this is, a, this is a project that you may have heard a little bit around the edges. We're finally in a position to sort of present some of our concepts. And as, as you um, have experienced, uh, we're always looking for ways to improve our facilities because we're, we're not really in a position to acquire new ones. So we have to make the ones that we have uh, function more effectively and then also generate the kind of revenue that we need to operate our program. So that's something we also have to consider, balance, that balancing act. This, uh, this proposed project tries to do that in, in, uh, in the same way we have in other areas. Okay, so the Davis Center is located at West Victoria Street and De La Vina Street. It's on a 0.8 acre lot and uh, only two blocks from State Street. The facility shares a parking lot of over 100 parking spaces with the adjacent properties, the Teen Center and the Lawn Bowls. The original building has an entrance, entrance at uh, 1223, uh, 1232 De La Vina Street you can see at this location right here. And the building is 4,189 square feet. In 1923, the building was built by the Santa Barbara School District as a classroom and shop for vocational training. At that point, the entire block was part of the first public high school of Santa Barbara. In 1924, the high school was moved to its current location. In 1933, there was a remodel of the structure to be a community re, uh, recreation center. And then in 1969, the, uh, the deed, uh, it was deeded to the city and remodeled as a, an adult activity center named after Louise Lowry Davis Center. Uh, Louise Lowry Davis, the city, a city recreation supervisor and woman, woman sports advocate. After she had raised and donated a quarter of the funds for the renovation, in 1991 the site was declared a structure of merit. And and then and then then there was a. 2005 remodel focused on upgrading access, providing new restrooms, a ramp, sidewalks, along with interior improvements like heating, partial air conditioning, and major electrical upgrades. The current use centers around senior activities, hosting bridge, chess, tai chi, just to name a few. The top photo is of a Scrabble game. There's also senior-focused educational lectures and free hot lunches to low-income seniors Monday through Friday. As a community resource, the facility provides affordable meeting space to several groups in town. It also provides private event space for weddings, parties, and business events. The lower photo is of a wedding, and I want you to look carefully at this location here. This is the back wall. This will be important in a later slide. <coughs> Goals of objectives are to upgrade the building systems like lighting, air conditioning, speakers, windows, insulation, also to improve exterior aesthetics better curb appeal, signage, and a defined entrance, 
and increase site safety. Day and nighttime users have regular issues with loitering and illegal camping on site. We also want to expand the facility's use with flexible sized rooms to maximize the use, reduce office space to create a lounge and waiting area, and build a connection to the existing patio. The department's main goal is to maximize this community resource. You can see in the first photo on the left is a view from the street. When you visit this facility for the first time, you go up to the front door and it is locked. You see the sign, exit only. Or maybe you parked in the parking lot in the back, as you can see from this photo. The building is on this side is in the north and it's in deep shadow. So most folks will walk to the first door that they see, which is here. And that is locked. So you walk around to the next door and that is the entrance. This is a photograph of the entrance from straight on, but a lot of times there are parked vehicles on both sides and you don't see the light bollards. And this photo here is uh, the entrance from the side view and it has a awning that blends in with the building. It also has mirrored glass and a dark frame that uh, doesn't, uh, and the, the signage isn't visible. The existing interiors, here we have the top left is the reception area. This is the front door. And there are offices on both sides. And then at the, uh, the right top is the activity room. And at the bottom is the multi-purpose room also known as the Larry Crandell Room. You can see that over time the ceiling has come down and it has a institutional feel to it. it uh, my first feeling was it was a little claustrophobic, but it's a very nice, large meeting space. So during the outreach, there were several meetings with myself and the architectural team with facility staff, senior users, the League of Women Voters, and the AARP, who are regular users of the larger Larry Crandell room. And then probably the most illuminating was our meeting with caterers and event planners, who talked about opportunities uh, for this facility as a mid-size event venue because of its downtown location, its large parking lot, its his historic building, and the patio with a view of a classic Santa Barbara mountain range. At this point, I'd like to hand over the presentation to architect Ellen Bildston. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, thank you for hearing uh, our presentation this afternoon. Um, this next slide is one that uh, documents the existing plan of the Louise Lowry Davis Center um, to put the photos that um, Justin just showed you of different areas of the existing building. Um, on the left, uh, we have the, the multi-purpose room, otherwise known as the Larry Crandell room. Um, we enter on the right side of the existing kitchen, uh, and that directly connects us to the parking lot, which is just to the up the you know, the raised side of the plan uh, site plan that we're showing there. So you enter through that way. The reception area that Justin showed you a photo of has a freestanding desk area that people uh, check in for activities that they're there to participate in. 
The offices are tucked back, those two offices there. If you head straight from forward from the reception area, you get to the activity room that we saw a photo of there. Um, that's the smaller of the two meeting rooms that can be used for either programmed events or, um, or private events. Um, then in the center, we have a lot of um, the utilities and uh, spaces that involve plumbing. Uh, at the top of the plan, we've got the existing kitchen, which has direct access to that parking lot uh, if people were to bring food in from outside. Um, across the hall, we've got the existing men's and women's bathrooms that are ADA compliant to today's standards. There's an existing janitor closet just below that on the right and a storage room that's primarily accessed from the Larry Crandell side currently. And then we have a bit of a foyer to the door that, as Justin described, is uh, typically locked for security reasons coming in off of Delavina Street. Um, off to the right of this plan, you see there's a large existing paved area, um, which was a point of great interest for our team when we came and started analyzing the possibilities of where things could go with the building. On the next slide, we see the concept plan that we've come up with after hearing from the stakeholders and working together with Justin and the, and the team. Um, there are a lot of things about the, the existing plan that we would, we would certainly keep. Um, as a historic structure, we're not adding anything to the existing structure or changing anything in a fundamental way on the outside. Uh, the entrance is still going to be that same location on the upper, upper right side of the kitchen due to its connection to the parking lot. Um, we thought it would be interesting, like as the most fundamental change to the space, is to really take advantage of that existing paved area that we have off to the right. So our thinking there is to create a courtyard opportunity there with walls that kind of create an outdoor aspect to the building and as, as a indoor, giving an indoor outdoor kind of opportunity for the use of the building. We would get there by turning two sets of windows along that southeast side of the building. Existing lintels are there for windows and we would change out those windows to doors so that people who are using the building would be able to exit out into that new courtyard area that we're, that we're proposing. Um, there's a movable wall between what we're calling now the entry lounge and the activity room. Uh, so there's sliding panels. Uh, so that could be used either as two meeting spaces or one big one, depending on the positioning of that wall. Uh, there's storage that's up against the wall where we now have some uh, seismic bracing to just cover up some of that and get some useful storage uh, to happen for the activities that might be held in the entry room, uh, entry lounge and activity room. We would keep the bathrooms as they are, making you know no no changes there. The kitchen, um, from talking with the caterers, they took a look at it and felt that for this to be used effectively for perhaps weddings and other large gatherings, uh, it would be very useful to reconfigure some of the counters in there and have more open space under those counters instead of base cabinets. So we would just simplify the arrangement of things in that kitchen, but essentially keep the infrastructure as it is. Um, down below the men's and women's bathrooms that are unchanged, you would just reconfigure that storage area so that from either side, from the, either the activity room or the multi-purpose room, we could come into that shared space and right where it says storage room, uh, there'd be uh, wheeled carts for tables and chairs 
um, to set up or break down from whatever activities were happening in those adjacent spaces to reduce the confusion that a number of people have trying to uh, approach the building from De La Vina, we are thinking of changing that uh, entry landing and turn it into a balcony, which is then only accessed through the doors uh, from the interior space, and then remove the walkway that connects the sidewalk from De La Vina to that, what traditionally was used as the front door of the building, but is now something that we can't ADA, uh, we can't use it in that way. So therefore the back approach is working much better. Um, on the left of the plan, the multi-purpose room, Larry Crandell room, uh, essentially have changed in footprint in no way, um, but we're really excited about something we discovered from looking around above the acoustic tile ceiling that's there today. And I think it's on the next photo that we would see. Uh, that's kind of putting the existing and concept together. So maybe we can go to the next. Uh, th this is a view of that existing paved area that we would like to turn into a courtyard space. Uh, we discovered that there's some, uh, there's evidence of a previous trellis that was out in that space and we're thinking it might be really nice to bring that back. It's a historic element that um, could create some shade in that area and make that a really beautiful space for people to either spend some time before their activity begins or if it's a wedding, it might be a gathering space uh, during a ceremony or something like that. And surrounding it, we're thinking of something along the lines of a six-foot wall of some material. Uh, we're still studying different options on that, but to just create a real... Um, space that feels very connected. Those two center sets of windows right behind the lady you see walking by there are the windows that we would turn to doors uh, so that people would be able to exit from the building out to this courtyard. Um, next, I think we have the photos. Um, so we, on the left is a is a photo of just sort of an inspiration image that we found after we creeped around in the attic up there. It's a really beautifully uh, crafted ceiling that's there. The lower right is an actual photo of what's above the acoustic tile ceiling. Um, it's steel truss and really beautifully put together wood ceiling. And... Um, the, a lot of the things you see jutting through there are, are um, cables that are supporting the T-bar of the ceiling. So a lot of that would get cleared out in the process of, of opening that ceiling up. The upper right is a 3D model that our architecture firm put together on the basis of the actual configuration of those trusses up there since um, we figured, well, we couldn't even imagine quite how it would look if we were able to take that acoustic tile ceiling out of there. Um, so that's the type of space we anticipate the Larry Crandell room being, and we can achieve that on the other side as well. It's similarly configured, uh, we, and there's there happens to be a moment frame beam that we can use for sliding those panels across to sometimes divide that one space into two, if um, if that's desirable, depending on the activity. And uh, that's where we're headed. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Does anybody have any comments? Oh, we've got a, a, just oh, a few sorry. more slides, and then we'll open it up to questions. The uh, schedule is October. We're planning uh, late October, planning HLC. Concept review and then November preliminary construction estimate will help us kind of decide how much of a of scope of work we'd like to conquer with this project. And then in December, we'll evaluate all of our options, design options, before we go and move on to HLC project approval 
in February of 2017. And then in March of 2017, we would go with a RFP for the construction drawings. As far as budget, uh, this project has been uh, a priority for the Neighborhood Improvement Task Force for FY 16 and 17. Well, the department entered into a contract for $59,510 for preliminary design, permitting, and construction evaluation with Biltstein Architecture and Planning. And there will be final design fees uh, to allow for construction, uh, uh, final design fees to follow with a construction estimate. I wanted to end on this photo because it really shows the potential for that view of the courtyard. If you can picture not seeing any of the cars with a low wall and what you would see sitting on that patio, then I'd like to open it up for any questions. Thank, thank you both very much for the presentation. Um, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with the building. Um, having been a master gardener, I've held many um, public meetings in that building, um, particularly with the drought, and I'm also pretty familiar with the landscaping, um, which definitely needs some improvement um, with the exterior of the building. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, Number one was if if the the multi-purpose room or the Larry Crandell room, I guess, is rented out for a wedding, which I guess would be the more appropriate facility probably for a wedding. Um, it, how does one flow nicely from that particular room to the courtyard? I know that there are doors, but are we going through the little thing by where the storage is, or is yes. there going, we mm -hmm. are. We would put, is it going to be jazzed uh, up so it doesn't look like we're going through mm -hmm. the storage area? <laughs> yes, um, so there would be nice doors that go across the front of that storage area, some roll-down door or some segmented door of some sort um, so that it wouldn't feel like you were passing through a storage area. But the wall on the right of the um, of that center space, sort of that heavy right. dark one, is a structural wall that we really can't change in any okay. dramatic way. So as much as we would love to open that up and make it a clearer flow through there, um, we pretty much have to work with what we have so that we're not structurally changing things in any sort of okay, dramatic I, way. Okay, I understand. Um, the, 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 I guess the, the challenge, uh, the, how, do we have any idea if, if someone were, I can't read, I'm sorry, I just can't read the slide. The two, the two, the reception area or whatever you're calling that, yes. Uh, no, I'm sorry, go down. Entry lounge, yes. The entry lounge, and then I actually just passed an eye test, but I can't. <laughs> and then the activity room um, below it. Um, so those two would be, what's the difference in square footage? In other words, if someone were to rent that those two rooms plus the courtyard, mm -hmm. in, the, in other words, is there an opportunity to have a, an event, and how much smaller would it be? Mm -hmm. in those two rooms plus the courtyard than it would be in the in the, um, in the Larry Crandell, Crandell room. room. Yeah. So the Larry Crandell room is just over 1,500 square feet. Okay. 1,520 to be exact. Um, if you put the two spaces together, the entry lounge and the activity room, we would be at 1,200 square feet. Okay. If we put those two together. And then the courtyard... Uh, space like the landing that you come out to as well as the lower area and the trellis all put together is 2,800 square feet. Okay. So it's actually, it was interesting if you add up Crandell, 
the two other potential spaces to one another, those more or less equal the courtyard space. Right. Okay. We're almost doubling yeah. rentable space by okay. mm -hmm. creating the courtyard. Great. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, and um, one of the, the goals of the project that Justin mentioned is to upgrade building systems. So does that mean we're going to get some air conditioning in this building? Is that is that one of Chair the, Wiscombe, one of the goals? Chair that's correct. We uh, will provide air conditioning on the uh, other half of the building. I was there on the hottest day this week, and it was about 88 degrees in the activity room. Okay, yeah, because it's it's really, it. I know for any um, you know event that I've where I've you know. Master Gardeners has had had events there during hot days, and you have to open the windows and, to keep the flow. If you have, you know, we've had over a hundred people in the room, so it's um, it's been tough. the The other comment I'd make, and this is not related to conceptual phase, but something to think about is is to to make sure that um, that that there's improved um, coverage, window coverage in the Larry Crandell room. And I know that's a detailed design comment. It's not, but it's something that really should be included because that room, you have to close all the, close all the um, curtains and everything else. And then, you know, the air is stifling because it's hot outside. And um, so it's really hard, but um, it's very hard to see a PowerPoint presentation sometimes in the room mm -hmm. um, unless you close it all up and then you know, so I'm glad there's going to be air conditioning. Um, so um, the other comments that I had, um, uh, I like the fact, I like the concept of the courtyard walls because right now you you kind of feel like you're halfway in that parking lot, you know, when you're on the courtyard. There's no, you know, separation between the two. So I think that's a really, really nice concept. Um, I think that's, that's, that's great. And I also like the balcony on De La Vina because I think that will solve the problem of, well, this isn't the entrance to the building anymore. <laughs> so, um, and I thought I was intrigued by the trellis. So I hope that that is something that, that, you know, if you found evidence of that and it's something that that would be a a pretty mm -hmm. neat element because it can get pretty hot out in that courtyard. The trees are small, and and I don't even know if you would keep them, but um, it, it it definitely we needs. would keep the trees. Um, we've, we're working with the landscape architect, and all the trees that are there would remain. Mm. But your point is well taken. That that whole area is very hot and very, very hot. sunny in the middle of the day yes. with its southeast exposure. Um, so we're thinking this trellis would be a really wonderful way to just make it a much more desirable place for people to spend time and bring back this historic element that could be really interesting. Well, and, and also it will really, um, you know, whether walls are part of it or not, that would help really delineate that courtyard from the parking lot. Um, you know, right now it's done with, I think, a couple planters or something that, you know, and that sandbox that used to be there that's so out. vice chair clark and commissioners um just so you know when we put this out for rfp a key objective was to enclose that courtyard um we started off with we've got some at times very serious site safety considerations for both people that use the facility and our staff and we can solve those a little bit but ultimately, like our other areas where we have site safety considerations, we need to rethink what we're doing here. And not including the courtyard makes it really difficult to really think, rethink what we're doing here. Um, but to do it in a way that will allow us to respect the integrity of the historic structure, there was a trellis there. And it was removed because it fell into disrepair. And as, as we've experienced over the past decade plus, the courtyard becomes a place for people to hang out. So the more you provide things for people to hang out without making it a designated space for 
people using the facility, you create those problems as well. I think through the concept planning, we're kind of stuck in a way with the way the building's oriented towards the parking lot right now because of the ADA considerations. Uh, but trying to figure a way to jazz it up and make it look such that that is, that is a good entrance, a welcoming entrance, a place, a place to go into. Yeah, and I think I think that the the concept plan is um, addresses that nicely, and you know, and perhaps with some exterior um, uh, wayfinding that that will that will also help in terms of identifying that entrance. So you're not going in the Larry Crandell room when you when you come in, but going in the proper the proper doors on the other side. So um, so those are really all my comments. I I think it's very exciting. So. Yeah, nice presentation. I just want to say that my favorite part was the courtyard because I had no idea that was even a courtyard. I, you know, and I spent a lot of time there, going to a lot of meetings as well. So I think that that was a a really nice thing to see, and I think it addresses you know the the safety concerns. And you know, we live in Santa Barbara. The, you can live outdoors pretty much all the time. We we get no rain, so. Outdoor space is, is just as valuable as uh, interior space, so I, I definitely like that part of it. I just wanted to make one comment. I think it's exciting that you're doubling the rentable square footage footprint with that courtyard. And are you considering doing like a living wall, like a green wall kind of a thing with the courtyard? I think that would be really interesting. It could be that, certainly. Um, yeah, we're working, as I said, with the landscape architects, materials, how they play off of the landscape. Um, so, yeah, there are yeah, lots like a of green options. wall or something could bring the temperature down in there, too. It could make it a cooler atmosphere. But I'm excited. I've only ever entered through the Crandell room. Um, you know, there was, like, uh, candidate forums and things. The League of Women Voters meets there. But I, I thought that was the entrance on that side. I didn't even know there was a front entrance. So I think I think all the, the conceptual plans make a lot of sense and makes the building much more usable. I, I just had one quick, I love the courtyard, but I was wondering why there's two, are those just exits on the top of the courtyard and the bottom? Are those doors going to only grant egress? Correct, right. They're, they're gate. There are gates at either end of it for egress um, to the parking lot direction or to the sidewalk. Um, and that, that pathway that you see that connects the sidewalk to there already exists. Um, so we would just, that's what set up our, our geometry or the axis there. Um, the idea certainly is for people to enter the building, exit the building into the courtyard, but if someone handicapped just wanted to come directly there, there's a way that they could do it off those um, ADA ramps that are already there right, right near the parking lot. It just gives another option. Anyone else? No? Um, uh, I think pretty much everyone covered what I was going to say about this. I think it's fantastic, and I like the fact that we are... Um, looking towards improving one of our senior facilities that are used a lot by seniors because sometimes they get overlooked and I think this is going to be a great asset to that segment of our population. Nothing else to say? Vice Chair Clark, just I want to circle back to the funding because again it's sort of giving you the opportunity to think next couple of months ahead. Uh, in your staff report, it talks about $100,000 that was set aside. That's something that the city council has done for projects that um, are priorities of the Neighborhood Improvement Task Force. So this started as a safety and a recreation facility enhancement project, and we've kind of taken it to another level because our focus and priority is if we're going to touch it, let's try to do as much as we can because a, we don't know when we're going to come back and have that opportunity again, but really to be 
thinking about where we need to go for the future. So both the programming that we provide there today, but planning for the future. Uh, with that said, so the funding for where we are today is coming out of the general fund. This facility is within an eligible neighborhood for community development block grant funding. So when we look to sort of construction options, not design, but it's more likely to fund construction, it could be a project that we submit for that. We will need the funding to finish the plans, though. So that's one of the things that we'll be talking about in the next couple of of meetings is where where to do that out of the general fund and how to position ourselves to to, to secure the, those funds and then ultimately looking at okay where do we go for construction uh, your the schedule slide talks about historic landmarks commission that's a key step in the process so that's one of the next things that we'll be doing because they will be focusing on the building exterior and how we're being consistent with that historic integrity uh, if we get through that process um, fairly quickly, it'll position us to move the project forward um, expeditiously, funding dependent. All right, I'd like to adjourn this meeting.